Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Art of Transformation, stories of transformation and tools to get you there. I am very excited to welcome our next guest. Chris Oatley has been a friend of mine since before COVID. We actually got to see each other in person before everything went weird. Uh, and Chris has been helping artists develop careers in animation, games, and illustration since 2008. He's the founder of the Magic Box Academy. He's been in-house and out-of-house visual development for Disney, DreamWorks, Sony. He runs a podcast called You're a Better Artist Than You Think. And something I really love from um, your, one of your websites is that you help artists make the switch from aspiring to experienced. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah. Did I miss, any, did I, did I miss anything about your intro, about your accolades? Fantastic dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can confirm that. Um, <laughs> Great at dad jokes. I can confirm that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, verified, unverified. <laughs> I I just I I've known you for uh some number of years because we're yeah, you're um you're an educator among other things, uh a, an intensely creative person. So in the conversation that we had before the call, uh you told me some you told me that you wanted to be in visual development from from five years old. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, in visual storytelling for sure. I was mm. inspired by Jim Henson, as many of us were, uh early in life, and I would um create these elaborate uh some of them original scripts, <laughs> I guess you you could call them. Uh, starring various Jim Henson characters uh, for my kindergarten class uh, when I was very small. And, um, and yeah, just everything Muppets. I was a Muppets completionist. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, and, and I mean, and I still am to this. Well, there's, there's Herman even hangs way above my, uh, right next to Eddie Bitter there. And, um, I, you know, there, there is a certain, I feel like there's a certain, um, kinship that you share with Kermit in, in kind of a yeah kind of a good way yeah I mean I can talk about that all day long um <laughs> but yeah you know the Muppets and certainly Kermit as a person um you know were very influential uh early on um but I also drew all the time and though certainly I mean Jim Henson drew as well he was a great cartoonist and um and and there is drawing involved with that world of puppetry and and everything uh i it, it, being an actual illustrator and and um you know character designer at least as, aspiring um i started to feel like animation was a better fit hmm. and then that coincided in, and that was in the early 90s when i was a teenager <clears throat> And that coincided with the Disney Renaissance, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast. And I had a a transformative experience while watching Beauty and the Beast as a 13-year-old kid. And then um, pretty much from that point on, I wanted to work in animation. And so then I had, you know, my eye on the prize in that regard and started learning what, everything what I possibly was that? could. That was the 90s, right? That was... 90. I think Beauty and the Beast was 90, I want to say 92, mm, maybe a little great. earlier than that. I don't remember. I was 13. There was something, wasn't there something about the way that they did the animation in that film that was different at the time? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it's hand-drawn, um, the movie, uh, and there are some, you know, I mean, they didn't have to use actual multiplane camera by that point, but there were some, in the vein of the multiplane camera, there were some really beautiful uh, multi-plane shots in that movie and you know i think there was a little bit of rotoscoped cg that was kind of a thing that had just started to happen i i seem to recall that there's a cart that bell i haven't seen it in a long time but i think there's a cart that bell is uh, uh driving with a horse and i think that might even be computer generated so I, th mm. I think there were a few uh sort of um you know, innovations, very subtle, in a, a subtle use of some pretty significant innovations in that movie. But um, it was the, I believe it was the first animated feature to ever be nominated for best picture. 
mm. if I remember correctly. I know that was, uh, I, I think that was, uh, I think that's a thing. I'll have my yeah. fact checking team work yeah, on that. Please do. <laughs> please I do, do remember it. it was around the, <clears throat> it was around the same time. It wasn't Aladdin. Um, and I remember very distinctly seeing the sort of the opening you know, scenes in Aladdin where he falls into the cave. Yeah. And the cave's talking to him, you know. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Um, that, that whole really thing. <laughs> oh, that, that, that was, that was not that, that. Yeah. But, um, but I remember watching that and going, oh, that's computer generated. Like, that's interesting. They're doing yeah. that now. Yeah. And the magic carpet in Aladdin was computer generated. Mm. Beauty and the Beast is a, it's an infinitely better movie than Aladdin, but, um, but Aladdin had more uh, liberal use of, the emerging te technology so it's, it's interesting that you sort of you sort of came awake to this you know this career dream of yours during a time when disney was was sort of transforming itself in terms of what it's doing which is obviously the topic of this podcast. yeah yeah i was in the theater so i was I, my as throughout most of my young childhood from about fourth grade until when would that have been the eighth grade, like through uh, until I went to high school, I was severely bullied, like mm. really, really bad traumatic stuff. And, um, I was a really sensitive kid. And so that kind of made me a target and my, what they referred to as Coke bottle glasses was a big thing. And my, uh, fashion sense or lack thereof, there, there were all kinds of, all kinds of things. And, um, and so as a very young teenager, I kind of had this shell around my heart. I was, I was, uh, I, I, I don't, you'd have to ask my parents, but I, I don't think I was a particularly defensive person, but it was a defense, if that makes any, any sense at all. And, um, yeah. and so I, you know, I just didn't show, or I tried not to show any vulnerability Mm. whatsoever and then i'm in the theater and you get to the emotional climax of the movie which is almost the end of the movie and the beast effectively dies oh my god and spoiler bell uh <laughs> how old is the movie 30 40 year old 33 years <laughs> old something like that spoiler alert from three decades ago uh going on four um Belle throws herself over his, you know, lifeless body. Yeah. And, uh, and she just whispers, I love you. And then his transformation starts. And I was watching this happening. And what was so just hard to explain is that I'm sitting there in the theater and I'm being, as many people were, moved <laughs> profoundly mm -hmm. by Glenn Keane's animation and the score. And of course, the, the payoff, the emotional payoff that, that is, of uh, uh, you know, that credit goes to the many storytellers who, who crafted that movie. Um, Howard Ashman, of course, um, there were all these, you know, uh, uh, things leading up to that, um, uh, culminating in that, that, that moment emotionally. But, um, I'm watching this and I'm just fighting back the tears. I can, it's almost literal that I can feel, uh, uh it's, it's almost physical that I can feel that shell that I just described around my heart cracking, you know, oh. and I'm trying to hold back the tears and not cry. Cause I don't, and I was there by, with my mom and brother and I didn't want either of them to see me cry. And, and, uh, then I, but I'm super self-aware in this moment. So I'm, I'm aware of that feeling. And then at the same time, I'm aware, I know how animation works at, at that age. And so I'm aware that these are drawings making me feel this way I'm, I'm aware of both things like the analytical and the emotional simultaneously and so I'm holding back the tears and I'm going like oh but you know 24 frames per second you know like I'm I'm doing both and um and uh and so then and then I broke and I just weeping you know just absolutely weeping as the music's swelling and everything and I remember thinking like wow like I want to be able to do that for people you know i want to be able to create those kinds of experiences for people and um uh and so yeah so then that pretty i remember we left 
this was a frequent thing. We would go see um, an animated movie or a movie with a lot of cool visual effects or whatever it was. In other words, movies that have associated art of books. And then we would go across the street to the bookstore. My mom would always take us across the street to the bookstore. And then we would, you know, look at and or procure the art of book from the, uh, mm. from for that associated with, with the That's movie. A nice tradition. Seen. And, yeah, it was amazing. And, um, my parents were super supportive of my art in that, in that way, uh, in, in every way. Uh, but, uh, yeah. And so we went and we got the, the beauty and the beast book. And then my, um, my parents, uh, I remember they were, it was going to be a Christmas present. That movie came out very close to Christmas and it was going to be a Christmas present, but my mom didn't want me to have to go without it for that long. Cause she could tell how inspired I was. So <laughs> I I just took the book with me and I remember the same that night and for like the following week I'd come home from school and I would copy the Glenn Keane drawings just yeah. you know you know one to one and uh, and so I do that and then on whatever December 23rd or something they t they they said okay bring us your book and they went and they wrapped it up <laughs> so I could still <laughs> <laughs> unwrap it at christmas uh, yeah and they wrote this really beautiful uh, inscription in it which i will keep to myself but um yeah it, it just, it's a you still have the book yeah yeah wow was that the first book that you 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 copied you know in that way no i but i i well no i i copied all kinds of things a lot of ninja turtles yeah. um but no, uh, yeah, lots and lots of so many Ninja Turtles, G.I. Joe, you know, all that 80s stuff that that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of us were into. But then, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, Don Bluth, Disney. My, well, my uh, my first know. was and, and to this day, I still recommend this book is uh, How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. Oh, yeah. 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 That's right Just there, too. Copied that thing back to front. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Um. So, wow, you had this really, I mean, it sounds like transformative experience in this movie yeah. theater. And you had the support. Uh, you know, one of the things I like to sort of talk about on the podcast, or like, I, I try to figure out, like, what are the ingredients? Like, what are the ingredients that, mm. that were there for you? So, like, you know, you had the support. You had the support of family. You had, you know, the, you had this tradition. Um, and, you know, you had, the, you had the interest. And not for nothing, I mean, I think a lot of artists can probably relate, like, I, I, I also, you know, Ninja Turtles were kind of like my first, like, oh, I can kind of draw stuff. This is, okay, let me copy these guys and, um, and getting into mm -hmm. art that way and getting into art in part because I wasn't cool. <laughs> like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't being invited to all the, whatever other kids were doing. I'm sure they were doing, I'm, I don't even know, but I'm sure they were doing things. They just weren't doing it with me. Um, and so right. drawing in, in many ways was, uh, a refuge in a way like i don't want to make it sound like you know like it sounds like an 80s you know movie plot but like you know the, the art art was a was a thing that i was interested in and and that allowed me you know well i'll say this last thing and then i have another question for you but when i was looking at um art therapy programs before i before i got into coaching did a, did a bunch of reading and, and and books on that but you know art is a form of nonverbal communication it's so interesting right you know when we when we create whether you're creating you know illustrations or commercial stuff or you know fine uh, you know a abstract fine art you know higher whatever you want to call it um whatever you're doing like you're you're create you know you're creating this visual stuff uh and it's you know it's a way for a lot of us whether we realize it or not to process you know whatever's going on around us in a way yeah something i think is so amazing about visual art as communication and and this would be apart from visual storytelling of course you put a narrative in there and then it adds the, all of these other dimensions obviously but even just visual art takes something like jackson pollock or mark rothko you know it's it's not even something that's um objective in terms of content um but that's the point is that visual art can communicate the abstract not just abstract as an abstract art but the abstract abstract feelings and concepts and uh moods that's amazing and when what baffles me even more is that it can do that successfully and accurately mm. right <laughs> it's like you think about mark rothko and yes there are people who write off mark rothko unfortunately and just shut themselves off to that experience 
but the people who get it get it in very similar ways. Mm. It's like they're having, I mean, we all have our unique experiences and we all have different experiences, but they're also, there's a very similar kind of experience, uh, a, a very unified kind of Rothko experience. So he managed to pick colors, textures, and edges and scale that that communicates consistently so much of the you know um i think cliche around non-representational art like that is that uh it's just totally open open to interpretation and of course it is but also isn't it interesting that so many people have the same or or very similar interpretations anyway well, i just find well that yes and and on the flip side i mean even just from your story maybe non represent maybe it's interesting to think that non representational art would have a consistent you know reaction from you know the viewer the audience and at the same time here you are in a movie theater having an experience that probably not everyone in the theater had even though it was representational and and narrative yeah i think people have i think people respond to that moment in the same way like the the people that are feeling empathy for the beast and understanding well and for bell for that matter mm -hmm. you know i think we're we all are on the same page that's one of the reasons that movie is so powerful right everybody's on the same page um but i mean certainly i think you know my experience was not unique but but i do think it was profound and i think it was probably um uh, there there was a level of, of intensity there that probably you know, wasn't the case for a lot of people, but then, you know, just, I mean, not recently, but in relatively recently,